All right, hello everyone. Weston Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023 at Asia Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. Welcome to day two of Bank of Japan week as we head ever closer to Governor Ueda's very first Bank of Japan monetary policy meeting this Friday. So today's topic what I want to do is to just take a kind of a big picture, longer term look um, at the state of affairs with the Bank of Japan beyond this particular meeting, this Friday, April BOJ meeting. Um, and I want to do so in order to contextualize these individual policy meetings and actions and policies themselves um, that are being taken or that are not being taken. Um, and doing so, we can then attempt to see what the Bank of Japan's longer term of objectives are, and therefore what the possible options that the Bank of Japan has at its disposal in pursuit of those desired objectives or otherwise. But either way, this process of taking a step back, looking at the bigger picture is very necessary because we can't just blind ourselves looking through a microscope at each incremental policy um, step or policy meeting in isolation of one another we need to consider the aggregate picture first and then look at the individual steps and actions that are taken within. Otherwise, we don't stand a chance in even attempting to forecast the direction of travel um, in this long road trip of, of policy. Um, and instead, we'll just be completely lost because we're looking at tiny maps of individual towns as we pass through them. I don't know if that analogy made sense. Um, but in order to do that, what we need to do first is we need to take a look at the road already traveled to just keep using this analogy. Now, in my first episode, my inaugural episode of Market Depth about a month ago, I outlined the entire history of the previous Governor Kuroda's decade-long unprecedented tenure of policy experimentation and the results that came of it. And for those who missed it, here's a trailer of it. Here's the, the intro of it. So let's dive in. Last uh, 15 years, prices have been declining and declining. Japan is the only exception to in the world which has experienced inflation. This is a monetary phenomenon. And the central bank, uh, meaning Bank of Japan, must do whatever thing necessary to eradicate inflation. It's not often that the Fed plays second fiddle to anyone, but the Bank of Japan is front and center today. Bank of Japan decides to enter the money printing business. I thought central banks were meant to think long term. Is this Kuroda effectively being freaked out by three weeks of turbulence on, on capital markets? So crossing the delivery terminal here, the BOJ is saying that they're going to look at their yield curve at every single meeting there. No, look, I mean, the Bank of Japan succeeds by failing. So this over my shoulder is the Imperial Palace grounds, famously during the height of the Japan asset bubble. This plot of land was worth more than the entire land value of the state of California. So very lovely, yes. Was that a bubble? Probably. Concern about the purchasing of government bond. Again, that was the very first episode of Market Death Podcast, um, which launched right before Governor Kuroda's final Bank of Japan meeting um, in mid March last last month. Um, and that was the latest. That was the last meeting before this upcoming one under a brand new Governor Ueda. Um, so the full video is called Governor Kuroda, the decade's most consequential central banker. The link of that will be in the description of this video, and I definitely encourage you to watch it if you haven't, because it provides a very necessary and detailed timeline of all of the easing steps that Governor Crota had embarked on over this uh, decade-long tenure of exploring the wilderness of unprecedented easing policies um, for the rest of the central banking community to observe, if not follow, eventually. 
Um, and the reason that it matters now is because this is the policy framework and the massive JGB field balance sheet that Governor Ueda now inherits um, and is now in his hands, right? The policy doesn't just get to, you know, have an etch a sketch shake reset. Uh, it very much still exists in place regardless of whether or not the personnel is different. Um, and by the way, when I say is now in his hands, what I mean is what he's been handed um, and not in his hands as necessarily as in like in his control. Because as I say, BOJ policy, okay, and the position and scenario that the Bank of Japan finds itself in currently is now such that the personnel at the BOJ no longer run the policy, but rather the policy runs the BOJ personnel. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by the end of this episode. Now, yesterday, I laid out two of the major risks that may come of the Bank of Japan removing its accommodative policies. Number one was this sort of, you know, this, this idea of mass liquidation of foreign assets held by uh, Japanese capital to repatriate back home in favor of higher nominal JGB yields. And then the second risk being like uh, this igniting of an inferno of global bond market volatility amidst, amidst very illiquid and unstable sovereign bond markets. So those two risks are more so related to yield curve control policy and any changes that might come of yield curve control policy. But here's like here's a third risk, okay? And I, I don't put it in the same category as the other two, let alone want to label it as, you know, risk all the same, because the magnitude and the destruction of this would be at a level of, you know, a financial meteor striking. And that would be Japan, world's third largest economy, defaulting on its sovereign debt. So, in the scope of broadening out for this episode, I want to divide this episode into two parts. First part on yield curve control, and then the other part on broader debt dynamics of Japan. Okay? So first, yield curve control. As important as it is, I'm not going to go over the full history of the yield, of yield curve control now, because again, that's what that debut episode covers. So... Again, I suggest that you strongly, I strongly suggest that anyone who hasn't seen it uh, take a look at it. But what I want to do instead is I want to add some more color to the background and to the implementation of yield curve control that I didn't go over yet, um, with with some overlap as well, right? So basically, under conventional monetary policy, central bankers tinker with the very front end of the yield curve, right? The raising and the lowering of lowering of the the policy rate, be it Fed funds. For the Fed, or say the the cash rate for the Reserve Bank of Australia, and so on and so forth. And indeed, the Bank of Japan also tinkers with the policy rate, though not really too much tinkering these days, given the Bank of Japan has its policy rate on the floor at zero for the past two decades, and at minus zero point one since January of 2016, um, making it the only major central banker left with a negative policy rate currently. But Generally speaking, as far as yield curves go, right, the front end is influenced by central bank policy rates, and the longer end of the curve, say 10 years and further out, are more so determined by markets. So what yield curve control in Japan did was it essentially it took the 10-year yield, um, right, the, the long end of the curve, and it made that an additional policy rate explicitly set by the central bank. This was unprecedented then, and it remains unprecedented today. The Reserve Bank of Australia, the RBA, was the only other major central bank to kind of dabble with yield curve control. It only lasted like a year and a half. And the RBA, what they did was they targeted the front end of the Aussie yield curve, like two-year and three-year Aussie yields, right? Which is essentially like really no, not that too far you know, from the, the cash rate anyway. So even that wasn't yield curve control to the extent that the BOJ um, and its massively heavy hand um, you know, shoved into markets was all about, okay? Just a reminder, when yield curve control was first introduced in September of 2016, the aim at the time was to try to steepen the JGB curve because at the time, 10-year JGBs were yielding deeply negative. Um, and that was causing its own problems. But, you know, quite different from the purpose that yield curve control serves today, which is to cap long-term yields, you know, from running away to the upside. But in September 2016, the aim wasn't necessarily to put a floor 
under you know deeply negative JGB yields either. But it was simply to just take the 10-year yield and make it an additional policy rate and pin it to around zero. And this around zero, that wording and that concept is very important, okay? And it still remains today. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to give some more background on how yield cur curve control bands were introduced and how they became part of this whole you know um, process. So if you look at this, this is just a simple chart of the 10-year nominal JGB yield. Um, and you'll see that in September 2016, this is when yield curve control was introduced, okay? But prior to that, right, you can see that JGB 10s were yielding deeply negative, okay? And this is when Topics Bank stocks were, like, getting absolutely slammed um, because they were hit with a negative policy rate in January of that year in addition to, you know, having the, the long end of the curve in, in negative territory. Um, and that negative policy rate in January of that year, as you can see, that led to a massive collapse in the long end in the 10-year JGB yields as well. Basically, they were at, what, plus 30 basis points to, you know, sharply falling now down to near negative 30 basis points, okay? And that's something to keep in mind when we think about a potential, um, you know, market reaction that might come of if the Bank of Japan does remove the negative policy rate, okay? If they lift policy rates from negative territory into to zero or into positive or whatever it is, right? Um, because perhaps the reason that you're one of the reasons that the Bank of Japan has been dragging their feet on, you know, keeping this negative rate as, you know, in, in place is because they might be afraid that the kind of opposite market reaction might occur should they do that. And essentially, if they remove the negative policy rate and they lift it up to, to zero or to whatever it is, if they just move it higher, directionally higher, you might get an explosion of the entire curve uh, higher, just as the entire curve fell deeply, deeply downwards, uh, yields fell deeply downwards, even the, the longer end, when they introduced uh, negative policy uh, rates in Japan. Okay, so then if you look mid-year, right, right before the yield curve control implementation happened, you'll see that there was a significant jump upwards um, in yields from deeply negative back towards that zero bound before yield curve control, okay? And that was on an announcement, um, the prior meeting, prior to yield curve control being unveiled um, in August of 2016, when the Bank of Japan announced that they're going to undergo a policy review, much like what's being proposed for this Friday. And you can see there was a very big market reaction. Um, okay, September 2016, yield curve control is rolled out, and there is a target of, quote, around zero for the 10-year yield to trade. Then, nothing happens for some time, even as yields jump into positive territory, um, and this is because of the shock uh, Trump win in the tw November 2016 in presidential elections. Then in February 2017, the Bank of Japan announces its very first fixed rate operation. Fixed rate operation is how yield curve control is basically conducted. It's an offer to buy an unlimited amount of JGBs at price level X. Okay. Um, so this is the first time in February 2017 that the Bank of Japan actually acted on you know yield curve control by conducting a fixed rate operation, offering to buy unlimited JGBs at price level X. And this price level X happened to be when JGB yields, uh, JGB 10 years uh, were yielding at around just under 0.1%, 10 basis points. And from that point forward, markets now had a definitive explicit level at which the BOJ's otherwise very kind of murky around zero language it now clarified all that, um, and it clarified where the Bank of Japan was going to take action, what price level. And then, therefore, markets established that 10 basis points was the upside cap that the Bank of Japan would tolerate, um, and then did the reciprocal minus 10 basis points as the downside cap um, in which the Bank of Japan would potentially sell JGBs, and thus the concept of yield curve control trading bands plus minus trading bands were, uh, was established. Okay, so that's that's how that happened. Now, I've sat in three different private meetings with Bank of Japan board members 
um, and clients at the time of when I was on institutional finance. And all three of these like Bank Japan board members at the time, independently, completely independently of one another, had said that the Bank of Japan yield curve control price bands were never a creation of the Bank of Japan or even like something that they had conjured up, right? Let alone the levels themselves, but even just the concepts themselves, right? Markets just assumed that these were these were the levels, and by doing so, they made it a reality. And from that point forward, it was just assumed that whenever 10-year JGB yields would breach that 10 basis point level, the Bank of Japan would be expected to step in and offer to buy unlimited. So the Bank of Japan purposely used the term around zero, thinking that they can just step into markets at you know whatever level around zero that they, however they want to define it for that day, whatever. Um, but they didn't really grasp the nature of markets, which is that when you put a price level out there, markets will hold you to it, like down to the decimal point, right? And as time went on, they eventually, the Bank of Japan eventually became enslaved to very specific levels of where JGB yields um, would, would go and where they'd have to act, right? Because if they didn't, their perceived credibility and their commitment to yield curve control and unlimited buying would be tested by markets and yields would blast through that level. And so these trading bands became very sort of hard concrete support and resistance levels, and they still remain so today. And so as time went on, Bank of Japan's implicit yield curve control trading band levels would widen out because markets would test the BOJ. The Bank of Japan would offer to conduct fixed rate operations, buy unlimited, you know, offering to buy unlimited JGBs to cap yields, and then would just allow for higher or wider, you know, trading band levels. And markets would move in sort of round number increments with their with their sort of you know assumptions, their implicit assumptions, right? So it basically went from an ambiguous, non-explicit around zero to now having a plus minus 10 basis points target range to plus minus 20 basis points to plus minus 25 basis points. And then in December of 2022, now to plus minus 50 basis points. Um, and then somewhere in between like the plus minus 20 basis points and 25 basis points range, just like somewhere around 2020, BOJ actually started to put out like in writing within their policy statements that yield curve control has um, an explicit 25 basis points basis point cap, but they also actually started putting out policy statements too that actually read, you know, there is no cap. Uh, the explicit trading bans on YCC, like there are, there are no caps anymore. But all of that went wholly unnoticed because at the time, JGB yields were were not, you know, anywhere near those levels. Um, and shortly thereafter, those explicit in writing, okay, well, they're capped at 25 basis points, deal curve controls capped at 25 basis points, um, language would come back into policy statements. And so the point here is that while we tend to obsess over will they or won't they widen the yield curve control bands and all that, myself very much included in that, um, it's important to remember the in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, okay, and in the you know relatively long history of modern central banking, yield curve control is still a relatively brand new experimental policy that's only really been tested in August of 2018 and in 2022 and currently, okay? But yield curve control is a living, breathing, flexible, and adapt adaptive tool that no other central bank has any experience with um, other than the Bank of Japan. And the BOJ is once again, therefore, setting precedence for policy options as we speak, right? So while market strategists and economists and traders and whatnot for the most part, just lay out the Bank of Japan's options for yield curve control as either, you know, one, unchanged, two, widen out trading bands, three, get rid of it altogether. I'm sure that the Bank of Japan has tricks up its sleeve that we haven't even considered yet, and we won't even know of until they're released in real time, should that happen. Um, and they don't have to happen on monetary policy meeting days only. They can happen at any time, as was the nature of yield curve control from the start, that we can step in at any time, any time of day even, um, and cap yields. Take, for example, December 22, uh, when they widen the 10-year JGB trading bands to 50 basis points. Okay, so while, you know, all all the, the, the eyeballs and all the attention was, was on that part of the policy at the time, the Bank of Japan, in that policy statement, also announced that fixed rate ops, you know, offering to buy an unlimited, would now include any JGB with a coupon. <laughs> 
So that means it's not just 10-year JGBs anymore. It's 2-year, 5-year, 20-year, 30-year, and 40-year JGBs, not just 10 years. Um, and in the immediate days that followed this policy statement, the Bank of Japan and then yield started, JGB yield started blasting upwards. The BOJ began conducting fixed rate ops on two-year and five-year JGB yields for the first time ever as well, just this past December, and targeting shorter data maturities. And so therefore, going back to what I just said about how you know one central bank's strike price is explicitly set or acted upon, that becomes the market's now assumed support and resistance levels, right? So given that the Bank of Japan had offered to buy two-year JGBs at three basis points and five-year JGBs at 24 basis points in fixed rate ops for unlimited size, we can now assume that the markets assume that trading bans on two-year JGBs will be plus minus three basis points and five-year JGBs to be plus minus 24 basis points, along with the already established 10-year JGBs with plus minus 50 basis points as of current. Okay, so now there are three tenors with JGB, uh, you know, upper and lower band trading bands. It's not just the 10-year JGB as as it currently stands. Okay, so if any either one of those, a two-year, five-year, were to pop out um, and not be, you know, essentially guarded by the Bank of Japan yields curve control policy, well, you can see uh, front end yields move up significantly higher, um, not just in JGBs but also in markets like U.S. Treasuries. So yield curve control can be shape-shifted in ways that we don't even know. And so just be prepared for the notion that like a BOJ shock itself may be redefined. Like the shock might be an option that wasn't even on the table for consideration. Not like a shock that like we know what the extreme sort of small, tiny probability uh, event is and then that event occurring. Now the shock might be something completely out of left field. Okay, so that's how the BOJ has trapped itself in yield curve control as it currently stands, because it's simultaneously expected to hold the line at their explicit trading bands while also being expected to rid this policy incrementally or altogether. Um, and basically, when you've been suppressing yields that have been dying to burst out for this long and you know to, to this extreme, and, and then it's finally yields are finally allowed to do so, I mean, it's anyone's guess as to where markets go from there, yields go from there. And it's not going to be isolated, again, it's not going to be isolated within just Japan in a vacuum because JGBs are the world's duration anchor. Now, I finally want to just touch very quickly on the big picture of Japan's debt situation. Very simply, Japan cannot afford to have higher borrowing costs, period because uh, this is the most indebted country in the world and it has demographic structure that does not allow for debt to be repaid in principle or even just their their interest in, uh, on, on servicing their debt, okay? Here's a very simple graphic. On the left, you'll see Japan currently spends about a quarter of the national budget in just servicing existing debt. That is debt that is issued at rock bottom, artificially low yields, zero, basically, at free, okay? And yet Japan has a 250% debt to GDP ratio. Um, and yes, although these are all like different maturities and all that and different yields, let's just say for the, just for the sake of like very easy, simple math sake, okay? Let's just say that they're all 10 year JGBs that were issued in the last few years, which would be at 25 basis points. So basically if yield curve control bans were lifted to 1%, that's a fourfold increase in borrowing costs. That's the entire national budget. Um, again, oversimplified and doesn't apply that way, but you get the idea, right? You can't have borrowing costs go up. You, not even a little bit, okay? Then on the right side, just take a look at the amount of JGB issuance by the Ministry of Finance, by the government, um, compared to interest rate levels. So, very simply, again, the government cannot afford to have the Bank of Japan start lifting the long-end rates higher and higher, even in 25 basis point increments, let alone have the Bank of Japan just completely rip the Band-Aid off and be completely out of the market. The, the Ministry of Finance would not be able to finance itself and to just to service, you know, uh, and just to service existing debt. And then you're going to have Japan default on its debt. And if Japan defaults on its debt, that is not going to happen in a vacuum by any means. This is the third largest economy in the world. And even though it's the JDB market is half owned by the BOJ, this is still the second largest sovereign debt market in the world by notional size, second only to the United States Treasury market.
So basically, the Bank of Japan in the long term will have to come back to some form of yield curve control. It doesn't mean that, you know, yield curve control in current form, it might be structured and operated completely differently. It might be called something different. It might be repackaged and branded as something else. You know, very much like any time the Fed rolls out some form of market accommodation, they have they have a brand new facility and name for it, right? It's typically named after whatever the crisis it's responding to at the time. Um, but at the end of the day, it's performing the, you know, the function of backstop of last resort. Um, and the Bank of Japan is really no different. And all, all the central banks are no different from the Bank of Japan, right? Um, it's the market stabilizer of last resort as well as the lender of last resort, even if or especially if that last resort lending is to the government itself. And so I leave you with this clip of a meme video that I made. First of all, I'm not an actor or anything like that, okay? So this is just like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a clown. This is me being a clown, a macro clown. Um, but this is basically me playing Lex Friedman, interviewing Governor Kuroda uh, late last year. And yeah, it's like a joke, obviously. But the message, the core message of what I'm saying here is not at all a joke. It's very serious. It, this is what the Bank of Japan and other central banks, for that matter, ultimately what their purpose will be, right? So if you see any sort of changes and attempt to, you know, uh, alter yield curve control and this and that, of course that can happen and that likely will happen. But ultimately, it'll come back to central banks supporting government debt and government bond markets at the end of the day. Okay, so this is a clip from a meme video that I called A Few Good Yen. It's pinned on my Twitter uh, at Across the Spread. So make sure you follow me on uh, Twitter Across the Spread if you want to watch the full thing. Um, it's like eight minutes long or so. Um, but make sure, more importantly, that you are have your notifications turned on and make sure that you're watching Market Depth for the rest of this week as we continue to get closer to this Bank of Japan meeting on Friday. All right, thanks a lot. Governor Crota, did you order the unilateral intervention to keep pressure off of your JGB unlimited buying policy? Answer that question, because I'm entitled to an answer. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. We live in a world with untenable household, corporate, government debt. And we in Japan, and in the UK and the Eurozone, and even in the US, have some form of yield curve control and upper band walls. And those bands have to be guarded by men and women with printing presses. Who's going to do it? You, Joe Rogan? You, clown Weston Ackmore out there on YouTube? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for hedge fund widows and you curse the central banks? You have that luxury of not knowing what I know. That fair value suppression on JGBs and macro hedge fund widows and the death of price discovery and capitalism itself, while tragic, probably saved pension funds, portfolios, and financial stability, and Japan's very solvency. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves portfolios. You don't want the truth, because deep down in podcasts that you don't talk about, you want me on that yield curve. You need me on that yield curve. We use words like maintain, unlimited buying, and exit inappropriate. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of suppressed rate volatility and low yielding environment that I provide and then questions the very manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just say arigato and then went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up some JGBs yourself and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you're entitled to. Did you order the September and October intervention? You're goddamn right I did.